You're tuned to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcasted live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator. And he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for almost 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, folks, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Hello, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. And I've always been fascinated by the discovery of artifacts. I really am fascinated by meteorites. I've always been into dinosaur. When I was a kid, I just absolutely loved studying the dinosaur stuff. And the continual discovery of new artifacts and relics really provides us with clues to how both our ancestors and even ancient civilizations lived throughout human history and and really the history of our, you know, how we came to be where we are today. Newly unearthed fossils help to paint a picture of prehistoric life. There's so much we can learn about both prehistoric and human history through the discoveries made by paleontologists and archaeologists who often spend their entire careers in remote locations digging in the dirt, if not most of their careers. So this morning, I'm very excited to have on Chase Pipes. He is a Tennessee historian. He's a paleontologist, an archaeologist, and a geologist. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, He owns and operates Smoky Mountain Relic Room which is a Sevierville shop that sells artifacts from around the world. And in addition, he hosts the YouTube series, Chasing History, where he educates viewers on artifacts and fossils discovered throughout the world. Chase, it's great to have you with us. Good morning and welcome to More Living. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, that was quite a mouthful. You're a historian, a paleontologist, (laughs) an archaeologist, and a geologist. That's quite a resume. Um, well, hold on. Let's let, let's make a collection uh, a correction real quick. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not an academic paleontologist or an academic archaeologist. I'm an advocational paleontologist and and archaeologist, which is basically a citizen scientist. Um, I've studied just as much or, uh, as the professionals, and nine times out of ten, the advocationalists have more field time than than the academic groups but i basically make make a living going out and discovering history so were you i mean were you always interested in these fields how did you get your start did did it i mean i guess it started at a really young age when you when you were scrounging around was it in your backyard or tell me tell me how you got turned on to all this well, you know, I was a uh, I was a kid growing up on English Mountain, and uh, my parents had a had a small garden uh, right by the house, and in that garden were arrowheads. And like many people who live in in East Tennessee, you know, there were prehistoric uh, Neolithic cultures that lived basically where we're living right now. And I would go out into that garden and look for arrowheads, and it just fascinated me that where I'm living right now, you know. Thousands of years ago, there were people living their lives exactly where I'm living right now, but you couldn't see any of what they were. You know, you, you couldn't see where the only evidence that you had was what you could find in the ground. And so, when other kids started reading, you know, comic books and collecting baseball cards, uh, I was reading archaeological journals and collecting prehistoric relics. So it, it started at a very young age. You know, the arrowhead thing is pretty fascinating because there is a lot around this area. And interestingly enough, my wife is from Columbia, South Carolina, actually West Columbia. And her family owns a, a farm down there. Now, it's, uh, And they have collected arrowheads over the years and it's ama- that, that have been on their property. And it's amazing how many they have and how... Just, just looking from one to the next, the, just the ver, the variety, the different stories they tell, it's really pretty remarkable. If you just just on that one thing alone. 
Well, and and that's what you know. One of the things that we try to get across about artifacts and history and fossils and minerals and even meteorites that you're interested in is is that none of this stuff is rare. You know, that's the big misconception is that you know people have this perception that history is rare. Well, it's really not. You know, humanity has been making things for almost two million years. And we make a lot of stuff, and there have been a lot of human beings on this planet before us, and not all of it gets destroyed by a fire or rocks in the ground, or you know, even if it's broken in half, it's still there. So that's one of the things that we try to do with our, our YouTube series and our podcast is, is that's the educational arm for our, our shop uh, that shows people that history isn't rare uh, you can collect it. You can, you know, take care of it because that, that's the whole uh, thing that we're all about is taking care of this history because museums – I mean history is so not rare <laughs> that, there, that he, there are a lot of museums out there that do not want your stuff because they hmm. don't have the space to store it. You know, There's not enough room in all the museums in all the world to hold everything humanity made, and that's why it's up to individuals – to take it upon themselves to take care of that piece of history to ensure its, you know, journey through time. Well, that's a pretty interesting perspective because, yeah, I don't think of it that way. I think uh, most people listening, I think that's probably why you emphasized it. That yeah. you know, we yeah, think if we find something, it's some. Um, yeah. Well, you know, um, let, let's talk about meteorites real quickly. I want to at least hit on that. What what I love right. about what what I love about that is you 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 know can be looking at a rock or or whatever you want to call it that you know could be hun- you know millions of years old right I mean it mm-hmm. just is fascinating to me I have um I I'm into timepieces I love watches and my mm-hmm. wife and I'm also I also now she's really into astronomy and what we can learn about our history uh, from astronomy. And um, and I, I'm into that, too. She's into it even more than I am. But she got me a couple of Christmases ago, she got me a watch. And the dial, the face of the watch, is actually made from a sliver of meteorite. I it bet it's a, a sliver of, of Moon de Lusta meteorite. I don't know. Sweden, I think it was right? one that was in, it crashed in Europe in the 1800s, maybe? Yeah, that's the that's the Mundilusta meteorite in Sweden. I bet I know who met, who cut that meteorite. <laughs> that's amazing! Holy well, cow! Here's so, the thing, it, but but that really means I have on community. my wrist. That means I have a on my wrist a piece of material that is what fifty million years old, maybe a hundred. Uh, that meteorite. I can look it up real quick. Um, there's so uh, it's got a beautiful crystallization pattern. It's got all these lines and zags going all the it way does. across it. It does. It does. Yes. And so what that is is they cut that meteorite and they dip it in a mild acid solution. And what that does is that crystalline pattern that you're seeing. That's the crystalline structure of the meteorite, which is which is cool on a whole other level. It really. That, you know, you're yeah. actually seeing. The crystalline structure of of that iron meteorite, um, and there's only a handful of meteorites that have that. Um, but uh, I think that meteorite it fell, uh, I think, 15,000 years ago. But yeah, it could be millions and millions of years old, even billions of years old. You know. And I think um, the speculation was map. it was maybe part of the asteroid, you know, the ring. Um. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's fascinating uh, to see well, that. Well, and... just about all meteorites come from our asteroid belt. So they're all all part of our solar system. There are some that come from uh, outside uh, solar system, but they're very, very, very rare. Most meteorites are from, from our asteroid solar system. Asteroid belt. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So – I mean, I, growing up, that was one of my favorite things. It's kind of funny. I was into dinosaurs, and I was into our um, our, our our planets. Um, but dinosaurs was probably even at the very top. And I know the field of paleontology is small, but it gets lots of accolades when new discoveries 
are made. Can you tell us about your 2020 expedition to Colorado? Uh, yes. Uh, so we're digging the Morrison Formation in Colorado. Uh, there, there are two different groups of paleontologists. There's the um, there's the academic paleontologist, and then there's the avocational and um, uh, the the a collector group of paleontologists, and I, I belong more to the second group, but both groups work together to try to advance our understanding of science because that we, we're all science nerds. So when we dig stuff, um, only certain specimens, the specimens that are important to science, go to museums, and the other specimens go for public sale. So in Colorado, we were digging the uh, Morrison Formation. And that's a really cool formation. It's from the Jurassic Age. So let me back up just a second. So dinosaur fossils are found in layers of Earth, and these layers all have different names. And when I say the Morrison Formation, I'm talking about a specific layer of Earth that spans about five states. That's where this layer is geologically exposed on a hillside or cliff face or, or whatever. And um, – it's, it's like a different chapter in a book. Well, this is a very old chapter of the dinosaur story. This is the Jurassic period. So this is, this is you know, way back there, I think it's 120 million years, somewhere around in there to 150 million years. This is where you get the long-necked dinosaurs, the sauropods, the giants. You get animals like Allosaurus, who is basically a T-Rex-like great-great-granddaddy of T-Rex. And what's also fascinating about these fossils is, is that some of them are radioactive. Um, the Morrison Formation in uh, parts of Colorado and in Utah uh, on the western side uh, is where some of the largest deposits of natural uranium ore, uranium salts, are. And as those bones fossilized over millions of years, they absorb those uranium salts that are present within the soil, and so therefore are slightly radioactive. Not by much, but slightly radioactive, which I think adds another cool element to it that you can have you know, radioactive dinosaur, dinosaur bones, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Um, but, you know, we went out there to uh, excavate on a friend of mine's ranch. Uh, that's one thing that's important to note is, is that, you know, all of this stuff must be collected on private property with landowners' permission. It is illegal to collect uh, vertebrate fossils uh, of any kind on public or federal land. Um, so we're out working on a private ranch, and we're working in a quarry. We basically found an ancient river channel where over the millions of years that this river was present, bones and fossils, you know, di you know, animals would fall into and settle to the bottom and be covered up, and then that's where the fossilization pro process can go go forward. So, and we found all kinds of stuff. Um, there was a partial allosaur that came out of, off of this site. Uh, we found, you know, big section of sauropod vertebrae. You know, fill your back. And feel your your vertebrae. You can feel all the different vertebrae in your back. Well, this animal, one of this animal's vertebrae was as half as tall as I am. That just shows you how big these things these things are. So it yeah, was a that's, great great expedition. I can't imagine being involved in that. I mean, that'd be so exciting. I, I want to ask a little bit about. Um, you know, potential misconceptions we may have. Are we learning new things about dinosaurs that maybe we misunderstood? We, we are going to go ahead and get to our first break. So when we come back, we'll have more with Chase Pops as you listen to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're with you every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. and again, 3 to 4 p.m. You can also catch all of our podcasts online at broganfinancial.com. Click on radio. You can also find us on YouTube. Uh, we don't have video content. Well, we don't have videos of the radio show, but we do have all the audio content. And we're visiting this morning with Chase Pops, and we're chasing history. He is... 
uh, a historian, paleontologist, archaeologist, geologist. He's just really into studying artifacts and our history. And on the dinosaur thing, Chase, you know, we've been told for decades, you know, we've all learned all our lives that T-Rex was aggressive, mean, dinosaurs had scaly skin, you know, very much like reptiles. Maybe they weren't smart because of their tiny brains. Have we had recent discoveries that maybe have changed the way or what we know about dinosaurs? Well, and see, that's what's fascinating about history and which is why I love history so much is, is because it doesn't matter what field of history you're into, whether it be studying military history that happened 100 years ago or studying you know, fossil, you know, fossil animals and environments that are millions and millions of years old, is that there's – we are always discovering something new that completely rewrites our total understanding. So really there's, there's no such thing as an expert. You can, be, you can be up on the current knowledge, but because brand new things are being discovered all the time, you, know, you, you can't really be an expert on anything because we're always learning new stuff. And that's what makes studying history so awesome is because you are always – Always learning something new, no matter what. And and, and you know, Rex is a great example, you know, because we've had this perception since the turn of the century that you know all dinosaurs were lizard-like and scaly skin, you know, and um, and come to fact, that's not true. Most dinosaurs were actually feathered and looked more like birds than lizards. So T. Rex, for an example, that there's a uh, the that there's new findings out that when T. Rex was an infant, that it was actually feathered. Now, whether the feathers lasted through adulthood is is unknown, but uh, there have been specimens that were fossilized so well that we can see, you know, that there were feathers present on the body, which is just fascinating how this organic material. On, on, on an, yeah, there's an infant T-Rex that has uh, that oh that has uh, some some feathers attached to it, which completely blew the lids. Well, it's like raptors. You know, we watch the Jurassic Park movie and we see you know scaly raptors and everything like that, looking like ter- you know lizards. And all, almost all raptors had feathers on them. So, you know, it's just it, it, it it's what keeps you going. It's what keeps you going out there. Uh, this past summer, we were up digging the Two Medicine Formation in Montana uh, at a friend of mine's quarry, and it's it's hard rock digging. We're literally hammering solid rock, and the quality of fossils that are there is different than in other places. Um, he was able to discover evidence that you know showed that there were actually crocodiles present in the Two Medicine Formation, which was a brand new discovery. Nobody knew that that uh, or that um, croc- you know crocodiles lived that far you know inland in that particular formation. So that was a discovery that we were there for that happened right in front of us. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. So you know that's what makes this you know studying history so great. Now, what about behaviors and temperament of dinosaurs? Have have, have we come to understand that differently? Yeah, you know, there was the original theory that dinosaurs, you know, once they were, um, you know, once the young, they would abandon their nest and the young would, you know, be off to fend for themselves. And, and, you know, that's just, that's not really what we see in parenthood in the natural world today. And it's, it's, it's not true for back then on some species. There are some species that you know really nurtured and cared for their young. Uh, the myosaur, which is the Montana state dinosaur, uh, it's a great example. You know, uh, myosaur is mother lizard, um, and you know it. We sh- we can see that it cared for and took care of its young uh, by the presence of trackways where we have young and adult tracks throughout its you know its life right with it. So. There are behavioral traits that we can uh, that we can pick up and see, uh, yeah, and see, with the new but, advancements in. Go ahead. Well, I was just go, I was just gonna say for like for somebody like me who doesn't really know the science behind all this, I'm like, how in the world can we look at fossils and know how, you know, what their personalities were like? I mean, that just seems crazy to me. Well, there's some things that we can't that that we can never figure out. I mean, you know, th- there are some mysteries that are that are back there. But what we can do is is we can look at very similar animals and behaviors, 
in the wild uh, that exist today, and we can look at the trace evidence of that behavior. You know, footprints, for example, and you know, because we there are footprint trackways that are miles and miles long where you can actually see how this animal walked. Um, so they can look at environments today and look at the trace evidence that we find in the fossil record, and we can deduce that you know, all right, we have this behavior in this animal, and we can see it in the footprints, and we observe those footprints, and we have the same similar footprints with a similar stride, and so we can deduce behavior out of that. Chase, are there any recent paleontology discoveries that uh, that we should be excited about? Uh, you're going to have to you're going to have to help me out on that one. See, I I do such a large variety of history. You know, here at the Relic Room, we we literally have the largest diversity of history anywhere in North America. You know, we've got rocks that are or fossils that are 3.49 billion years old, and we've got Vietnam relics. I mean, we cover it all. So I. There, uh, you're alluding to something that I, I I haven't read or I'm not I'm not aware of. Okay, well let's uh, let's talk about some of your own expeditions. Like, what's the most exciting location you have visited when searching for artifacts? Uh, one of the most interesting periods of history that I've got to explore, and it's one of the most unknown, is the 1918 U.S. invasion of Mexico. It's called the Punitive Expedition. Uh, a lot of people think that the U.S. got into World War I over the Lusitania, and that's not – it really wasn't the Lusitania. It was the, uh, the, um, the German collusion with the Mexican government to invade the United States, and we, we – copy or uh, there were captured um, uh, diplomatic dispatches that you know alluded to this you know Germany trying to get Mexico to go in and you know stir trouble to keep the United States out of World War one so the United States sent 110,000 troops from 1916 to the 20s all along the United States border and we went and metal detected that history um, and one of the uh, one of the sites that we found, what was fascinating about metal detecting and searching for history out in uh, out in the desert is is on the same same layer you get you know an artifact from the 1880s you can find or the 19 or 1916 you can find an artifact that's you know 5,000 years old all on the same surface because there's not much erosion uh, being built up or th there. There's a lot of erosion in the desert, so they're all on the same surface. And we were exploring a uh, an area that was a um, a uh, training field where the cavalry were, where early aircraft was used. Uh, and my buddy found a um, a weight for an antenna on a wire that no, n there wasn't a single example that still survived. It was for early aircraft communication, and right beside that was a spur dated 1916 that was laying on the surface. And when you go and you pick up an artifact, that artifact, that cavalry spur, you know, left by a soldier serving on the border, it just it gives you a thrill like nothing else. Uh, so that that was always one of my favorite one of my favorite things that that I've explored yeah, artifact wise. You, you studying from uh, I mean the the fact that you look at all of it from artifacts millions of years ago to things even from Vietnam as you said earlier that's pretty fascinating to the, that it's so varied and different. Tell you what we're going to get to our bottom mm -hmm. of the hour break where we come back we're going to dive into some local uh, stuff. Uh, Civil War batter, battles, Native American inhabitants. We'll get into some of that local th stuff. We'll also have our dollars and cents segment. What is going on with inflation? As we saw it creep up again, go even higher, 6.2% in the month of October, year over year. What does that mean for you and your money in the future? And what and what what is the future? It's clearly, the Fed uh, mis under or excuse me underestimated the length of some of these inflationary trends. So we'll have that as well, so stay tuned. we got a lot more here on More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. 
Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and we've been, we're visiting with Chase Pipes, and we're chasing history. We're looking at all of the different stuff that goes, all the different historical finds and new things we're learning, even about dinosaurs and just really fascinating things. Uh, before we get back to Chase, however, it is time for Dollars and Cents. Sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. Inflation was the big headline this past week. Headline in CPI inflation is running at 6.2% year over year. Core CPI, 4.6% year over year in October. So it really has become a concern, uh, an even bigger concern. Now, the Fed has been saying for months that inflation is transitory. It's temporary. Well, what does temporary even mean? Um, now, if we look at, I mean, we know some of the things going on right now with inflation are not things that are, gonna, that are normal. You know, if we look at used cars, new car prices, household supplies, things like that are still continuing to drift higher. And we expect that eventually, especially with supply chain uh, issues being hopefully solved, which may take a good while, by the way. You know, we anticipate those to come down, but there are some less transitory categories, food, energy, shelter, medical costs that are also creeping up. It, become, it, it is becoming more and more apparent that inflation is going to be higher for a while. The supply chain issue is probably going to stretch at least for six more months, uh, maybe even longer. And things are just costing a lot more money. And, and inflation is like a hidden tax. It affects all Americans. If anything, it affects lower income Americans even more harshly than middle and upper middle and upper uh, uh, income Americans. So what can we expect moving forward? I think it's going to be a while before we see, we're, we're going to be over 2.5% core inflation, in my opinion, well into 2022, uh, given all these extenuating circumstances. Probably 25 to 3%. And when will that really come down? I'm not sure. The Fed believe it or not, has now, Fed Chairman Powell has now redefined what transitory means. And he, he, he literally wrote this on November the 3rd. He, he said transitory is a word that people have had, had different understandings of. For some, it carries a sense of short-lived, and that's, you know, that there's a real-time component measured in months, let's say. Really, for us, meaning the Federal Reserve, what transitory has meant is that if something is transitory, it will not leave behind it permanently or persistently higher inflation. Well, I mean, you could almost use that definition for any economic environment because eventually the inflation would stop, more than likely. So I think consumer prices are getting set higher. I think inflation, at least through most of 2022, is going to be two and a half, three percent or higher. I don't think we're going to see two percent, which has been the Fed's target. Could be a while. Will we see that again in two years? It's hard to say. The bottom line is retirement income inflation is one of your most powerful enemies. And you have to have a plan to increase income over time. And people are living longer and longer lives. You know, a 65-year-old female is expected to live to 91 years old. A, a 65-year-old male is expected to live to 88. Many, many people now live in, well into their 90s. Don't look at when your parents passed away or your aunts and uncles and assume that that's about how long you would live because our generation is living longer 
than our parents and our aunts and uncles. So inflation is a very powerful opponent. You've got to have a plan to be able to have increasing income well into your 80s and even into your 90s. I know you won't be spending as much on discretionary spending as you get older, but your medical costs will offset a lot of that. So you need a plan to increase income over time. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting BroganFinancial.com. All the components of a financial plan become critically important in fighting inflation. It's, it's, not, you know, it's getting your money to grow to produce more income 10 years from now, 15 years from now. It's also your Social Security election, understanding widow benefits, spousal benefits, how do you have stability of income in the short term but growth of income in the long term? How do you factor in all of these different threats to your retirement income? Uh, so for more information, just follow us online. We're always putting out new guides. We have our new our Social Security guide out. If you click on broganfinancial.com and go to resources, you can download a, just a plethora of information and also catch all of our podcasts. Go to broganfinancial.com and click on radio. This week, we're visiting with Chase Pipes. Uh, he's a local historian, paleontologist, archaeologist. The list goes on and on and on. Um, and it's quite, in, it's quite interesting as we chase our history. And Chase, Tennessee does have a, a, a ton of history, ranging from Native American inhabitants to Civil War battles. What makes the landscape around East Tennessee and our history so exciting and unique to study? I, you know, we talked about arrowheads earlier. What other things make this area so interesting? Well, one, I'm glad you asked that question because most Tennesseans don't realize it or know it or even think about it. But, you know, our mountains that we have here, you know, the, the southern highlands of the Appalachians, you know, that's one of the oldest mountain chains on Earth. I mean, it's 350 million years old. There are hardly any mountains anywhere on Earth that are as old as our mountains. And just when you go up into those mountains, you get this ancient feeling. You know, uh, that it's it's a wonderful thing, but it's also a curse uh, because things don't like to fossilize in mountains. We, we don't have a whole lot of fossils uh, in Tennessee. Uh, there are in Middle and West Tennessee. Uh, there's some Cretaceous dinosaur stuff, but it's very few and far between. Um, but, you know, we've also got the Watauga Association. You know, it was the very first free and independent community on the continent – created by Europeans of American birth. I mean, it's before the Declaration of Independence was signed, there were people living in a free and independent community in Tennessee, you know, um, separate from British rule. I mean, that's a fascinating story and a history. Um, you know, even the Civil War history what was was fascinating. You know, I don't think today not so much not so many people like to, to hear it as much, but uh, but East Tennessee was was a very divided uh, state in the Civil War. There were, a, were over 20,000 people uh, from East Tennessee who fought for the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, most people in Tennessee, East Tennessee just wanted to be left alone, and East Tennessee tried to separate from Middle and West Tennessee like West Virginia and Virginia did. So Tennessee has got a fascinating story, and it's been my home since – uh, my first family came through in 1774, and we've been here ever since. So I'm, I'm a very proud East Tennessean. Yeah, I am too. I'm with you on that one, Chase. Um, now, the process of digging up and preserving these fossils can be very long and cumbersome. And I know with archaeological and history sites, there are very specific guidelines for correction. Can you briefly walk us through some of these processes? Can you repeat that question real quick? Yes, just the some of the there are very specific guidelines, you know, with things like archaeological and historic sites, for in terms of collection, that can it can be quite time consuming. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of those processes? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the archaeology is it is a destructive process. Once you dig something up, it cannot be. Um, it can't be redug. So it's when you it, when you excavate a site, you're in a sense destroying the site. So things are 
it's important to look at how things were laid. It can tell you so much about you know what what life was like back then, and that kind of adds to our better understanding of of history. And so the archaeological process, where it is a destructive process, it is a uh, it is a valuable process to gain information. But what's fascinating, what they're doing on a lot of archaeological sites today, is they're gritting it out, and they're digging a one meter square, and then not digging a one meter square next to it, and then hmm. dig like a checkerboard. They're digging it yeah. out like a checkerboard, and what that allows is that allows a portion of that site the integrity of that site to remain for future archaeologists with new technologies because the the technologies that that it are are being developed today and that exist today i mean we can just about see into the ground and see objects in the ground and how things lay and how the soil is and where it was the ground disturbed so on and so forth um that we're we're digging is fewer and fewer. Uh, our store manager uh, here at the Relic Room, uh, Chris Kaufman, he is a uh, a uh, he got his uh, degree in archaeology. He's a graduate of East Tennessee State University. And one of the fascinating things that they were teaching him to do was that there's not going to be as much actual excavation going forward in the future. It's more of going into these warehouses and into these storage areas and going through what has been dug over the past 100 years because a lot of things have been dug. The problem that we have is is that the construction methods of the 21st century are different than that of the 20th and the 19th and the so on and so forth centuries where we go into a construction site. We literally level the entire ground instead of just building with the – with the slope of the hill or with the landscape, the entire site is level and a building is put on. And so what that does is, is that destroys any archaeology uh, that could be found. So it's really a race against time because you know there, there are more human beings on this planet than any time in history, and that will continue to grow. And with human beings, need places to live, work, shop. And so our history is, is literally being erased by our own progress and development. So we're visiting you know, with Chase. Sure, we're visiting. I'm Go sorry, ahead. Chase. We do need to get to our last break, and then when we come back. I want to ask you how that we can actually own. You know what it's like to own ancient artifacts, and the different access we have to that. So stay tuned. This is more Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Thanks for tuning in. This is More Living on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. Do check us out online, BroganFinancial.com. We will continue to bring you new content so you can make informed and prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life in retirement. I know I'm going to be coming out with an inflation guide this coming week. So stay tuned. You can sign up for a weekly e-newsletter blast that gives you links to all the new content we put out. Today we're visiting with Chase Pipes, who chases history through artifacts, archaeological finds, all kinds of things, geology, paleontology. Chase, um, I mentioned, you know, we can actually own ancient artifacts, and they're on display, you know, they're, they're not only on display in museums throughout the world, but as you said earlier, they're not really necessarily as rare as we may think, and we can own part of these ancient artifacts. What is the appeal to owning your own part of history. I mean, I'll tell you, I love the fact that my wife got me that watch that has that dial that has a sliver of meteorite from millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of years ago. I mean, that's really cool. Well, not only can you own artifacts and fossils and minerals and meteorites, but you can actually go out and discover them yourself. Uh, if you want to, we can do a whole other show on how your audience can get involved in in going out and finding this stuff. But you know, when it comes to human history specifically, uh, and even the fossil history as well, you know, I see it as it's more of a responsibility. It's back to, you know, humanity's been making stuff for two million years, and there's more of it out there than all the museums and all the world can hold. So it's really our responsibility because you may buy that item, but you don't own it. 
You know, I don't own everything we have for sale in the relic room. I'm just its caretaker. So you're really paying for the right to have the responsibility to take care of that item for your life so that that item can do its job, and that is to tell the story of what it witnessed and that it can be passed down to the next generation. So you're, that's you're a great word. That's, buying yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at that. Um, hey, and I tell you what. what we try to instill in people. Absolutely. Chase, we're unfortunately out of time. I've just got about 40 seconds here, but how can people, where can people go to find more about Chasing History or your latest adventures? We've got a discovery documentary series on YouTube called Chasing History. Just type in Chasing History. Go into Google, type in Smoky Mountain Relic Room, or if you're familiar with Sevierville and the Knife Works, we are located inside the Knife Works, Smoky Mountain Knife Works, downstairs, exit 407 in Sevierville. And just Google Smoky Mountain Relic Room, and you can find out all kinds of great stuff on us. That's fascinating stuff. Chase, thank you so much for being with us this morning and giving your time. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. That's Chase Pops, again, Chasing History on YouTube. Also, you can check him out out in, in uh, Pigeon Forge. Um, he, it just at that, out of the part of the Knife Work store. Very, very fascinating stuff. Today we've discussed history because understanding our history provides a greater perception of our world, and that can provide for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you to Chris for engineering the show. Thank you, Jill, for producing the show. Check us out online, broganfinancial.com. We'll continue to bring you great information and keep you abreast of all that's happening in the financial world especially. Thanks for tuning in as we've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on the News and Talk of East Tennessee, News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.